Lee, thank you so much for nice joining us. Um, so just coming off of Jay Powell's testimony in front of Congress today, speaking you know, fairly positively about the economy, but saying that he's seeing some conflicting signals out there, how should stock market investors be reading his comments today? Well, I have an overriding, first of all, in terms of the Fed, they're going to be data dependent. If the data supports a rise, they'll increase rates. If data doesn't, they won't. And my guess is they're on hold for the foreseeable future. Maybe, maybe you get something happening by December, depending upon how the economy unfolds. But I, lead, I read him as being very practical, very pragmatic, and he's going to just uh, wait, wait to see what the data suggests. I think on a bigger picture, we're in a very abnormal world, and I think investors have to recognize that. The reason I say we're in an abnormal world is there's somewhere, depending upon whether it's Bloomberg or J.P. Morgan, somewhere between 9 and $11 trillion of sovereign debt has a negative interest rate. Just think about it. You know, you lend money to Germany for two years, you get negative return. You lend money to Germany for 10 years, maybe you get 10 basis points. You lend money to Japan for 10 years, you get zero. Okay, it's not a real world. So I, as an investor, try to figure out what's normal, okay? To me, what's normal, I've said this repeatedly, it's old news, is the labor force grows in America about a half of 1% a year. The productivity of the labor force grows 1.5%. Labor force growth and productivity growth determine real growth. So that's 2% real. And we're probably slowing to that kind of level right now. And the inflation that we're looking for is 2%, so we'll call that 4% nominal. In a 4% nominal world, the 10-year government bond ought to be 4%, not 2.6. It may take several years to get there because of global interest rates. And the Fed funds rate ought to be something like 3%, currently 2 and a quarter. In that world, I think the S&P ought to trade between 16 and 17 times earnings. And S&P earnings we're using this year at 170. So if I put a 16 to 17 multiple on 170, you come up with a market that's somewhere around fair value. So you think the market currently is trading at fair value? Yeah, it's fair value. But you know, important to me, uh, the S&P might be fair value. I can find a lot of stocks that are attractive relative to their fair value. And importantly, the conditions that would normally lead to a big market decline just don't seem to be present. What are the conditions that lead to a big market decline? Number one is the stock market smells an oncoming recession. Uh, recession isn't in the cards. Economic slowdown, yes, but recession isn't in the cards. Second, a hostile Fed. The Fed is far, far away from anything hostile. Interest rates adjusted for inflation are zero. Normally, you have four or 500 basis point real rate before you bring the stock market and the economy down. Okay, thirdly is speculative valuation. We don't have speculative valuation. And we don't have the public uh, you know, operating in a speculative fashion. The fourth thing which you can't forecast is uh, some kind of significant geopolitical event uh, that just happens out of the blue and yeah. lots to worry about. North Korea, Ukraine, you name it. The White House, we have an unconventional White House which is destabilizing people a little bit. But I think the conditions of big decline are in present. The market is on a fair value. Uh, we're, we're okay. Mr. Cooperman, it's Kelly. I and have I'm, very, yeah, I just wanted to jump I in. I would say I, I have significant long-term concerns, however. Yes. Go ahead, but go ahead Kelly. Plenty, How are you doing? There are plenty of those to go around. I'm, I'm very well, thank you. And it's good to see you. And I'm glad you're here today um, because I wanted to ask you what your opinion is, having tangled with the SEC over the years, what do you think of the way that they're treating Elon Musk? You know, the way that he's tweeted, uh, he says, look, they're, they kind of have a vendetta against him, and, and they're singling him out for unfair treatment. What do you think? I don't know. He's, br he's brilliant. Uh, his situation and my situation are totally uh, uh, different. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he's brilliant, but he conducts himself like he needs adult supervision. You know, and uh, I'm not an investor in Tesla. If I wasn't invested in Tesla, I would be very worried about his deportment. Um, and uh, you know, he runs a public company. He's got a responsibility to the public. My situation was totally different. You sure. know, I entered into what's called no admit, no deny. So I, I have to be careful what I say. But the bottom line is uh, the SEC is very wrong-minded in what they do. They're abusive in their conduct. I've said that publicly. You know, and I will only tell you a little story. This is all true. And I have a witness to the story. About a year ago, Price Waterhouse sponsored a seminar in Palm Beach, and the guest speaker was Mary Jo White, who was the head of the SEC when right. my case was brought. And I went, and I went over to her, introduced myself, and I said, you know, you're lucky I'm a gentleman. I'm not going to attack you in public. It's not my style. But here's a sealed envelope with a question. If you answer the question, I'll give $100,000 to your favorite charity. And she, she was game. She says, I can't wait. What's the question? 
I said, when you went after me, my lawyers told you they studied all the trading, there's no case here, you can't possibly win. And your staff responded, if Mr. Cooper would like to settle, we'll take a five-year bar from the industry, an admission of guilt, and a $10 million fine. And I told my lawyers, look, I didn't go to Harvard, I didn't go to Yale Law School, that's where you guys probably went. Uh, you could tell them they could have the Rockefeller salute as my response. Okay, now the question, you came back five months later with no new information. Yeah. Okay, and said, okay, no admission, no, no admit, no deny, no time out, and give us 4.9 million. What did you learn between your first ask, which destroyed the, helped destroy the business, and your second ask, Sure. which I would have accepted if it was your first staff just to get rid of you. So that's and her response, why... and I have a witness to the response, let me tell you what the response was. Innocent people, she didn't say I was innocent, she said innocent people often settle because the litigation costs and time demands are so much greater than the settlement costs. And that's what they bank on, and mm -hmm. it's disgraceful. Well, and that's it's absolutely disgraceful. We're, and that's why I wanted to ask you about the Tesla situation, and it's interesting that you're saying in that case, if you were an investor in Tesla, you would be concerned about Elon Musk's de uh, deportment. Why is that? Well, his behavior. He's got to behave like he's got to behave like an adult. You know, this is stuff tweeting and saying things and contradicting yourself. And you know, I don't. I, I'm not involved in Tesla, so I don't know whether they're going to produce 500,000 units this year, which is what I guess what he said in the tweet, and then later on in a sudden different number. You know, he's better off just keeping to himself. And and, and uh, I think that most intelligent, sane people would recognize his brilliance. But, you know, he's undermining himself. It's a little bit like the president, in a sense. You know, who can argue with the uh, successful ideas that the president's had, okay? Uh, who can argue with the strength of the economy? What we can argue with is if he could be a little bit more balanced and recognize the need to conduct himself as the president of the country and not of his base. But who, I, I said he vanquished 16 opponents. He won the presidency. Who am I to tell him how to conduct <laughs> himself? But, you know, time will tell now, in, uh, in 2011, you wrote an open letter uh, to then-President Barack Obama looking at issues related to class warfare. And I'm curious how you view the current political environment and what's going on on perhaps both sides of the aisles as it relates to what you saw back in it's 2011. Very, uh, if you ask me about my long-term concerns, or concern number one is there's too much debt in the system. Mm -hmm. I was very surprised how abruptly the economy slowed in response to a very small rise in rates. That tells me that there's too much debt in the mm. system. Public debt and private debt? Public and private debt, yes. And the second thing that bothers me, to be honest with you, is I think the tax package, while correct for corporate America, probably gave too much to wealthy people at a time when the economy mm. didn't need the stimulation. And I think that's going to come back and bite us in the can one of these days. What day, I can't tell you. The third thing that bothers me greatly is the uh, apparent move to the left that's taking place in the country which really results from income disparity, which I'm very sympathetic to. You know, I'm a kid out of the South Bronx. I went to public grade school, public high school, public college. I was lucky enough to make a lot of money on Wall Street. I'm giving it all back, not half. I've told Warren Buffett asking for half isn't asking for enough. I've taken the giving pledge. But I think that what made America great is our uh, system of capitalism. And capitalism has some flaws, but socialism has no benefits. Okay, and so I'm very worried. I think what happened in New York uh, with the movement led by AOC, I guess, her, her mm -hmm. nickname Alexandria is, Ocasio yeah, Cortez, I, uh, uh -huh. is disgraceful. I mean, the number of jobs lost, the wealth. You mean with Amazon? With Amazon? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely disgraceful, totally disgraceful um, and wrong. And uh, I, I give you a quote. It's the only reason I have a piece of paper. Everything else I don't need. But basically, <laughs> the main vice of capitalism is the uneven distribution of prosperity. The main vice of socialism is the equal distribution of uh, um, misery. And, uh, you know, I'm committed to capitalism. Everybody has a hero figure in life, you know. Mine is Ken Langone. I read his book, I Love Capitalism. He's, he's a great human being. He's on point. And basically, we have to make sure the country does not move to the left. And what we have is a bunch of candidates running on the Democratic ticket that are leftward leaning. And that's just in my opinion, very counterproductive, very destructive. So you believe a potential wealth redistribution lowering, that would decrease the wealth gap in the country, would be worse for the economy than... Long term, sure. I mean, basically, um, I just so much evidence. You know, two or three years ago, I went to Cuba on a mission just before it was legal to go. You could go on an educational mission. And the Cuban people are hardworking, industrious people. They're prospering, prospering in Miami. You go to Cuba, and the Cuban people get one quarter of a chicken once a month for their protein rationing. 
They spend two hours to commute from the countryside to downtown Havana because they have no organized transportation system. It costs about $3.75 a minute for cell phone service, which is ridiculous. So they have no cell phones that people can't afford it. They have no satellite service, and they live in dilapidated conditions. And that's socialism versus capitalism. Now, why do we want to up for that? You know, and uh, it's all understandable what's going on. It's just difficult to deal with it. You know, Mr. Bernanke understood in 2008 the economy was going down the toilet. He had to reverse that. The best way to reverse was to get wealth up because the economist Pigou said 5% of changes in wealth worked its way into consumption. So he figured the best way to get wealth up is to get the stock market up. And the trouble with that is there's a disproportionate ownership of who owns the stocks. Okay? Then the government tried to deal with that by creating financial suppression. They said, okay, you guys got a big windfall from the stock market, but we're going to give you no return on your savings uh, for as far as we can see. Because if you adjust the, the coupons on, on bonds and on treasuries and on right. short-term paper for inflation and interest rates, you're, you're losing ground. Right. Now they're trying to say, well, the wealthy have done so well in the last decade because of what the Fed has done, we want to take it back. And so Elizabeth Warren wants wealth taxes, and uh, AOC wants a 70% marginal tax. These people are crazy, in my opinion, basically. We have to deal with it in a different way. My view, basically, is I believe in the progressive income tax structure. I believe wealthy people should pay more. I happen to believe I'm my brother's keeper, you know? That's why I'm giving all my money back to society. But we have to agree as a nation, what should the maximum tax rate be on wealthy people? Because that will define the revenue yield to the U.S. government, okay? Now, a lot of the politicians, they won't deal with it flat on. I hope Mr. Buffett isn't upset with me. I'm a huge admirer of his. But I called him five years ago and said, Warren, I agree with you that wealthy people should pay more. What do you have in mind? He says, if you make a million dollars a year, a 35% tax rate. If you make five million or more, a 40% tax rate. I'd sign on the dotted line and that instantaneously. If you live in New York, <coughs> New Jersey, Connecticut, California, high tax states, you're already in the 50s. What is the, it's, it's a moral question. What should the people give up of their hard work? You know, I'm lucky, okay? I worked very hard, but I worked right. hard doing what I love. I yes. love what I do, I do what I love. And I don't mind giving it back, but I think there's a question what the working person should do. If you ask right. the man in the street what the typical tax rate is of the wealthy people, they wouldn't have no clue. All right, well, Lee Cooperman, thank you so much. So a lot much of thoughts the there, a lot to unpack. I'm gonna send it back over to you, Kelly. Thanks so much.